Hello, welcome to the presentation, There's a Fungus Among Us. I'm Leslie Kaiser, Garden Coordinator for CURE and a moderator for this session. Our presenter this evening is Victoria Justice. In her capacity as a master gardener, Victoria has revealed her passion for the natural world in self-authored presentations to civic groups, gardening clubs, and schools across Northwest Indiana. Being a master naturalist and amateur photographer rounds out her abilities to bring nature indoors to adults and children alike stirring imaginations as well as awareness. Victoria, thanks for joining us this evening. Oh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's really great to see you all here to know more about the world's fungus. A mushroom walks into a saloon. The bartender says, you can't come in here. And the fungus says, why not? I'm a fungi. I know that's really terrible. It's the only one I could think of. To begin with, when we hear the word fungus, we tend to think of it in terms of our own life experience. For instance, my lawn had a fungus, or my cousin had valley fever, or My siding might be getting just a little bit of mildew on it. However, when we enjoy a thick slice of homemade bread slathered with soft margarine or butter, the word fungus couldn't be farther from our minds. So as you can see, the coin has two sides. The lowly fungus has much more to offer. So let's take a look. Fungi are pretty peculiar life forms. They seem to pop up out of nowhere, sometimes just overnight. And they can be pretty strange looking, living in the forest, dimly lit, sporting unexpected colors, perhaps slime covered tentacles, or even a malodorous aura. Some are toxic. They have the uncanny ability to break down structures in nature. Their cell walls are rich in chitin, the same chitin that we find in the crunchy exoskeleton of insects, but they're not animals. They don't photosynthesize. They don't make their own food. They don't produce flowers or seeds. Instead, Fungi use spores to reproduce. The experts who study fungi are called mycologists. MYCO, the prefix, can lead us directly to something fungus related. And even the experts don't necessarily always agree on just where to place certain kinds of fungi. So those categories tend to be a little fluid. Check out these purple coral fungus. They look like lavender coyotes baying at the harvest moon. They're super tiny, as we can see by the growth medium. We can see the actual grains of soil in the material that these little fungi are growing in. And that's because this picture is very close up. It's a tight photo probably taken with a macro lens. And that's why we can see the enlarged grains of soil. We see the little fungi in an enlarged form too as well. They're usually in real life, pretty tiny, but they do have a niche in the medical community, a very special niche. They allow us to type our blood. They're also involved in another process that involves finding antibodies. Who knew? Here are some interesting fungi, some examples. The one on the upper left is called octopus stinkhorn. A stinkhorn is vertically oriented. It's rather narrow. And as this one matures, its segments tend to peel back like a banana, and it looks for all the world like a bright red octopus. 
Below it is the aptly named wiffle ball fungus. On the right-hand side, it looks like, hmm, an inverted bunch of shredded carrot. What it's really showing us is if we grow cedar and something in the apple family in the same area, we are almost guaranteed to get cedar apple fungus. Up on the right, we have the ever popular dog vomit fungus. It's very common in the mulch that we use in our gardens to make it go away, just mix it up a little with your leaf rake and in a couple of days, it'll be gone. My favorite is the one in the middle, very colorful. I like the sharp contrast. I don't like to call it bleeding tooth fungus. I much prefer strawberries and cream fungus. Sounds much better. Now look behind all these photos you will see a white material that looks like angel hair left from Christmas. What it really is, is mycelium. It's made of these tiny hair-like structures. They're tiny little tubes. When we get a bunch of hyphae, these tiny tubes together, then we can call them mycelium. Up in this insert in the very top, we see two mushrooms. I took this photo out in the dunes at about the same time of year, a few years ago. This mushroom, the one on the left, dispersed its spores. They're so tiny that the slightest breath of wind will carry them. A few of them landed on the mushroom next door and they really liked it there. So they decided to germinate. And what we're looking at is mycelium in its infancy, so to speak. If you've ever had sticky black dots on your house, you have experienced the art artillery shot fungus. These cups are the, the fruiting bodies of that artillery shot fungus. That too is common in mulch in the garden. Now you'd have to have really good eyesight or a magnifying glass to look inside this little cup within the fungus fruiting body and see the ammo inside it. There are a few black cannonballs in there. They contain the spores. When the spores are ready to be dispersed, that cannonball fungus can project those spores in the cannonballs up to 18 feet. And when they stick onto your house, they're very difficult to get off. You, they can be on your lawn furniture, heaven knows, on your car, they can stick to anything. And if you have not been successful in getting rid of them off your house, talk to me afterwards and I'll share with you what I have found that's super easy. More mycelium, this is quite dense much more dense than the one we've seen on the earlier slide. In real life, here is what mycelium can look like. It's subterranean. And when it's time for it to reproduce, it sends up a fruiting body. In this case, the fruiting body is mushroom. The fruiting body is not the fungus. It is merely the fruiting body, much like an apple is not an apple tree. It's merely the fruiting body of the apple tree. And what is a mushroom made of? We see the hyphae below ground. And when it's all compressed and joined together, it becomes mycelium. And when the fruiting body appears, it's filled with compressed Hyphae. And I know you're going to be glad to think about that every time you eat a mushroom from now on. Uh, this diagram is showing us the life cycle of a mushroom. Here's the mycelium. When it's time to reproduce, the, the mycelium then creates a hyphal knot. That knot matures into a primordia, looks like a baby mushroom. That matures into a full grown mushroom. This particular one has gills under the cap. Under the cap is where the spores are produced. 
at the edge of each gill, and you haven't seen these because they're infinitesimally small. These little structures, basidia, actually produce the spores. When they're released, they settle wherever they're blown by the wind. If it's a favorable spot, they germinate and we have hyphae. The hyphae have a great affinity for each other. They join together and become the mycelium and the whole process happens again. Yes, molds are fungi. They are multicellular fungi. We've all seen them. They grow in wet or moist places. They even grow on our food. Here's a slice of bread that has gone moldy. We knew we should have put it in the freezer, but we didn't. And we didn't eat it up fast enough. So it has become moldy in its plastic wrapper. We see a cutaway here. These are not roots. These are rhizoids. They don't function as roots. They merely hold an organism in place. And that's what is happening here. We can see the sporangia as they mature and disperse spores, more spores on the bread. When you see mold on the surface of the bread, that's only the tip of the iceberg. The mycelium of that fungus is all throughout that slice. Once you see it on the surface, it's too late. The whole slice of bread is filled with mycelium. And it's a very bad idea to think you can cut off that moldy spot and eat the bread anyway, because we know that the mycelium is throughout the slice. So it's a bad idea to eat moldy bread or that fuzzy bowl of noodles at the back of the fridge. Um, the mold itself might give you a stomach upset um, and a lower GI upset, but if you are unfortunate enough to be allergic to molds, that could produce an unfavorable reaction. So that's the multicellular mold fungus. We have unicellular fungi, unicellular, one cell. These are dividing, this, this cell is dividing here and this one is dividing. We have two kinds of unicellular fungi. One is brewer's yeast, the other is baker's yeast. Brewer's yeast allows us to ferment grains or fruits to create a cold beer for a hot day or a lovely glass of wine with a perfect dinner. The baker's yeast then gives us the, the crust for our pizza. It gives us delicious homemade bread like that, that mahogany crusted braided challah bread or the panettone at Christmas or coffee cakes and sweet rolls and donuts and I'm getting hungry. We need to go to the next slide. Here we have lichen. In our region, this one in the lower right-hand corner is the one that we will probably see. It's gonna be growing on a tree. It starts out these tiny little bits. And then after a certain point in time, the bigger medallions grow. These are quite lovely and they're in my favorite color. So I guess that's why I like them. These are the kind that grow on hard surfaces like a stone or concrete, they're much smaller, and they have the ability to emit a substance that can actually break down that very hard surface that it is adhering to. It's not like big chunks are falling off, they're just minute bits that maybe the rain will wash away or the wind will blow away and they end up on the ground and become part of the soil. So they produce soil. Now this one, we don't so much see in our area here, but I like chartreuse colors too. So I like this one just as much. And is it a fungus or is it not? Here's how the whole story goes. Lichen are not green. We'll get to why these are green in a minute. They're not green and they don't photosynthesize. This lichen was looking for someone to cook for it. Couldn't make its own food. 
So it hung a sign up for rent. And who answered the sign? A blue-green algae. The algae said to the fungus, I would like to live with you. I'm, I'm here to, to um, answer your sign. The lichen opened its doors, in walked the blue-green algae, the doors closed, the two formed a symbiotic relationship and lived happily ever after. A symbiotic relationship means one hand washes the other. Each party in this relationship is supposed to benefit. So how does the algae benefit? It gets a protected place to live. It has a house, it has a home, and it's happy. And how does the lichen benefit? The lichen does not make its own food. So when the algae photosynthesizes, it makes a little extra and shares its food with the lichen fungus. So I guess technically we have to call the lichen a fungus. Here's two more that you can help me decide. Are they a fungus or are they not? If I call the one on the left liverwurst, it's gonna be just automatic. I love liverwurst, but this is a liverwort. Wart in the plant world means a small plant. Liverworts are very primitive. Those are not leaves that we're looking at. They look like bear paws with alligator skin. Um, they form ribbons. They're actually long and narrow. Um, the liverwort and the moss are both green. They photosynthesize. That means they're plants. However, they both produce spores to reproduce rather than using seeds. You can see on the top of this moss, the sporangia ready to blow their top and disperse those spores. But even though they are spore producing, they're not fungi. They like to live where it's wet, where it's moist. They get their food um, for the most part from the water that they're sitting in, whatever is dissolved in that water. If they can use it, they use it. Their photosynthesis is not as um, productive as, as other green plants are. This particular type of plant is called a bryophyte. And there are probably more than 8,000 species in existence as we know them. The last one I'm going to subject you to is a fern. Could it be a fungus? It uses spores to reproduce. If you grow some ferns in your garden, tomorrow morning, first thing, I'd like you to go out into your garden and turn over the leaves on your fern. We call the leaves the fronds. On the backs of the fern leaves is where the spores live. My Japanese painted ferns right now, the backs of the leaves are brown from edge to edge. They are simply loaded. It looks like the leaves themselves are brown. They are so full of spores at this particular time. Um, but even though they produce spores, they're still green, they photosynthesize, they have roots, they have a vascular system. They are not fern, not, excuse me, not fungi, they are polypodiopsida. And what you see in the insert here is actually a very old, old, old fossil of a fungus. How old is it? Wait for it. More than 300 million years old. Now, I was all set to tell you all about the decomposers, of which I had investigated and thought I believed what I was told, that ferns and mosses are among the group of um, plants and critters that we call decomposers. 
Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Can you imagine what this world would look like if nothing decayed, if nothing decomposed, if every tree that ever fell in any forest never decomposed? Any bit of organic matter was still where it lay when it fell. Just leaves themselves. Can you imagine? We would be up to our eyeballs in organic matter if there was nothing to help these things break down. Well, thank goodness for Earth's cleanup crew, the decomposers. They're made up of microbes, insects, worms, especially fungi, and maybe mosses and ferns. The research that I've done told me that they were decomposers. And I don't know why I doubted it. I, I guess I, I found one article that wasn't too sure. And then I found other very technical articles that were almost impossible for me to understand. But what I got out of them was, some of them said that ferns and mosses are opportunists and they're merely on a, on a fallen log because the decomposers are doing their job and breaking down that log into its basic components. And, the, and the, uh, uh, the ferns and the mosses as opportunists were just there to utilize those basic components. But then even more of those technical articles said that yes, these plants actually have a relationship with fungi to complete their nutritional needs, that their photosynthesis is incomplete. And they use at, at least some stages of their life cycle, they use fungi. So here we see a fruiting body. So we know that this log from stem to stern is full of mycelium, which can be helping the ferns and the mosses. The next time you go out in the woods, Check out the fallen logs and you'll notice how very much moss is growing on fallen logs. Not so many ferns, but a lot of moss. A very small phylum of fungus, uh, as a matter of fact, it's an anaerobic fungus, um, helps ruminant animals. We know the ruminants graze all day and they eat a lot of fiber. That's all they eat. Well, here come the Neocalamastigomycetes that live in their gut in the absence of air, and they help the ruminants to digest all the, fung all the fiber that they eat. Folklore has it that fairy rings grow where the fairies dance. We know that there's buried wood in the ground and that is sending up its fruiting bodies. And how do we make the, the fairy rings go away? The fairy rings go away when the wood has finished decomposing. Now this is, this is the part of the presentation that, that I really like. We're getting to the food part. On the right hand side, we see common white button mushrooms, the kind that we can buy at the grocery any month of the year. They have a very mild, pleasant flavor. We put them on our pizza, we put them on our steak. They're very easy to grow. We even go to the nursery and buy mushroom compost. The organisms on the left are not easy to grow, not in the least. They're described uh, their flavor is described as umami. As um, it's used now, umami is used as one of the basic flavors, sweet, sour, bitter, um, tart. And that was wrong, but it's number five in that grouping of flavors. It's described as delicious, rich in a meaty sense. 
absolutely wonderful tasting. And that's how truffles are described. The slices of it actually look like slices of a roast. If we're gonna describe a meaty flavor, coincidentally, that's what that one looks like. And where do they come from? They come from a fungus. They are a fruiting body. They are a subterranean fruiting body. Mushrooms come to the surface. Truffles do not, they stay underground. Do they grow in this country? Some do in the Northwest um, and some in the South where um, pecan trees grow, but they're not of, of any great quality like the ones in Europe, that's where we get ours. And how are they found? Well, truffle hunters take their animal that will help them find it and they go out into the woods and they look under trees and they find with the help of their animal, they find the truffle. In years past and still today, some used girl pigs. The girl pigs don't have to be trained to find the truffles. They love them and they, they just automatically will hunt them. The boy truffles, not so much. So the truffle hunter takes his girl pig out into the woods and she um, discovers where a, a truffle is growing and she starts to dig. At that point, the truffle hunter and the pig have a discussion as to who is going to get the truffle because the pig really loves truffles. That's why a lot of truffle hunters now use dogs, dogs that are trained to find them. Dogs don't care to eat them. They get different rewards for finding one. And once the dog finds the truffle, the hunter carefully digs it up, takes it out and carefully pats the hole back, doesn't want to disturb that fungus underground. That fungus is called a mycorrhizal fungus. Now, have you heard the term no-till farming? Remember how carefully that truffle hunter dug up the truffle and how carefully he patted the soil back not to destroy the fungus. Some folks, when um, they make a garden, Every spring, they rototill it all up. Is that a good idea? Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Because 95% of our plants utilize mycorrhizal fungi. They are there in the soil. So with these, these truffles that grow in Europe, how do we get them? We ordered them online. Here's some photos of various kinds of truffle. Um, I tried to get some, some current prices. Um, I'll just do three of them. The middle one is called Bianchetto. It grows in every region of Italy. Um, it's, it's a good truffle. It's very good truffle. It's probably not as good as the super special ones. If you want to buy a Bianchetto today, one Bianchetto will cost you $118 and change plus shipping, shipping from Italy. The one in the lower right that's available, as you can see by the dates, it's available from December the 1st to March the 15th. That's when the seasons are. You'll notice all of these have dates on them. This fine black truffle from France is called the Perigord or as it's more widely known, the black diamond of Provence. And you can't just buy one Paragord, you have to buy a pound. So you might as well be a restaurant if you're going to buy a pound because all you're gonna use is thin slices to flavor your food. That's enough, these are very potent. So a pound of Paragord from France is going to set you back $3,100. And last and certainly not least, the Lamborghini of truffles, the Italian Alba, the white truffle, the one that is the most sought after. If you want to buy a pound of Alba, you will cough up $6,700 plus shipping. 
And these mycorrhizal fungi, do they only produce truffles? No, they don't. You've walked in the woods and you've noticed often under various trees, you'll see mush mushrooms growing, especially at this time of the year. As a matter of fact, you might wanna go out uh, tomorrow or the next day after these rains and, and you will see some lovely things, especially at the dunes. Um, I've, I've taken some really cool pictures at, of mushrooms at the dunes. This is how the mycorrhizae work. It's a partnership between a fungus, the mycorrhizae, and a plant. In this case, it's a tree. This tree has green leaves, it photosynthesizes. With the energy of the sun, CO2, and hydrogen from water, those three things enable the tree to create its own food. And here it comes down through the phloem as far as the roots. If this is a true symbiotic relationship, both parties must benefit. So the fungus is attached to the root of the plant, just superficially attached. And when that nourishment comes down the pipe, the fungus gladly accepts it. So now what does the fungus do for the tree? The tree roots, as you can see, can only go so far. They grow very slowly and they only grow so far. However, the hyphae of the fungus can go far and wide and it easily collects water and minerals for the tree. It can even collect substances that the tree would never ever have access to without having the fungus. And do they share? They share with the mosses, with the mixotrophic plants. And this one produces mushrooms as fruiting body. This one does not, does not produce truffles. If you by any chance get Smithsonian Magazine or you can lay hands on it at the library, um, you'll find an article in the June issue from just this last summer about how truffles, uh, the growing of truffles is being um, experimented with even as we speak here in the United States. Um, it's a project to create jobs in the Carolinas. Um, the, the people that are doing this are having some great successes and some failures, and we'll see how that works out. The June issue of Smithsonian. How do we know this stuff is true? How, how do we know about these mycorrhizal fungi? From a person by the name of Suzanne Samard, she is a forest ecology professor at that university. She's a research scientist as well. Grew up um, uh, when her dad was a forester, when she became an adult, she had that love of trees. She became a forester, was disappointed in the, in the practices of the forestry industry. Um, and so she went to school. She elevated her education and did a ton of experimentation. And this little diagram talks about what she found. The biggest dots in this diagram are the hub trees in this area. She affectionately calls them mother trees. They're the biggest, the healthiest, the oldest with the most memories. Yes, memories. The other dots are smaller trees of various species. The lines joining them are their lines of communication. A tree is being attacked by something that's eating its leaves. And yes, a tree can feel when it's being eaten. Other plants can as well. That tree then sends out an SOS through the lines of communication to the other trees in that group. It says, I'm being eaten. Send me some of your defenses to help me ward off this attack. And while you're at it, put up your own defenses because you can be eaten too. Some trees exchange water with trees that aren't uh, appearing to get enough. 
or nutrition, if they're not getting enough, if they're in poor health and they need more nutrition? And are these all one species of tree? Are they all oaks? Are they all maples? No, they are not. Do they share with each other, regardless of what species they belong to? Yes, they do share, no matter what species. We could take a lesson from that. They even help the saplings. And there's just a little nepotism in the mother trees, just a little bit. They help their own babies a tiny bit more than they help their others. But this is a wood wide web. Here's a cartoony drawing of it. That's what um, Professor Samard calls that, those lines of communication, the wood wide web, play on words. And we know that morel mushrooms are of mycorrhizal origins. So we see this big morel sending a communication on the wood wide web. Here are some edible mushrooms. This one, um, some call it hen of the woods, some call it sheep head, some call it ram's head, um, some call it maitake. This is oyster mushroom. Here is our friend, the morel. Um, morels have lookalikes, as do most of the edible mushrooms that we find out in the woods. So if you're going to eat mushrooms from the woods, that skill takes years to develop properly, years. You have to know what you're looking for and what you're not looking for. The lookalike might have characteristics that are just a shade different from the edible one, and you must know both of them. Even experts make mistakes. My dad was a good mushroom hunter and he once made a mistake and luckily just got very sick. After that, he relegated himself to hunt only two kinds of mushrooms that he was absolutely sure of. These creminis, look at them closely, look at the shape. They're sometimes called baby bellas. Do they look like this? Yes, they're in the same family. You remember what the white Button mushrooms looked like same family, different stages of development. That's why we see them in the grocer. They're easy to grow. Um, other mushrooms are not. Wild mushrooms are not easy to grow in captivity. Here we see some Japanese enoki that often find their way into our stir fries. Here is porcini, otherwise known as balit. These, instead of having gills, have pores where the spores are produced. Antioxidants and anti-inflammatories are in great supply in some mushrooms. Mushrooms are very healthy food, high in potassium, low in cholesterol, low in fat. The fats that are there are linoleic, they're good for you. Very nutritious things mushrooms are. Um, and all different types. You have your choice of many different kinds um, to find what you like the most. This list of mushrooms is showing the amount of antioxidants and anti-inflammatories in these mushrooms. The ones at the top of the list have the most, the ones at the bottom the least. The most is that belete, that mushroom with pores uh, to produce spores rather than gills. Down here we have in last place, portabella, morels, just because they're popular and tasty doesn't necessarily mean they are the most nutritious. Are mushrooms really a superfood? Well, if they can do all of the things that people say they can, like fight cell damage, improve brain function, support bone health, lower a person's risk of diabetes, plus give us antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. I'd say it's a good bargain, a very good bargain. Notice in the background, we see some cute red mushrooms. In mushrooms, red is, uh, cute red mushrooms don't mean that you can eat them, quite the opposite. Mushrooms can have gills. 
They can have pores like beletes. They can have ridges like chanterelles. They can have tiny teeth that look like mini stalactites like hedgehog mushrooms. They all produce spores. I was driving down um, County Line Road a couple years ago. It was late October, a gorgeous sunny day, kind of warm outside. And as I passed that little cemetery on the west side of the road, that's just north of 73rd Avenue, I happened to see across the road, a big oak tree. And underneath it was a humongous colony of bright orange mushrooms. And I had my big camera in the car. So I pulled off the road and spent the next 45 minutes crawling around in the grass and laying on my belly, taking pictures of these gorgeous, colorful mushrooms. And I took the um, the card from my camera and put it in my computer, downloaded the, the images, and I was taken with the color of these mushrooms. They were so beautiful. And I researched and discovered that they were called Umphalotus illudens. As I read, I realized that illudens was like illuminate. And it was said that at certain life stage in these mushrooms, not the babies, not the old depleted ones, but the ones in their prime are supposed to glow in the dark. They have bioluminescent qualities like a bunch of these other mushrooms on this slide. Well, of course I didn't pick any um, and to bring home with me, I just don't, I don't do that. I don't gather things in the wild. If I take something, then the next person can't enjoy it too. So I was in this predicament. It was getting, it's getting late in the day. And um, did I want to go and see if these things really glow in the dark? Um, it would be really dark when I, by the time I got there and the cemeteries across the street and it's almost Halloween. And so I may never know if Umphalotus illudens, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, that's what it's called, really does glow in the dark. Now here we have the lowly turkey tail fungus. It's a bracket fungus. We get that name from the shape of it. The name turkey tail, of course, means it looks like the turkey's tail when it's all fanned out and pretty. The back of it is studded with pores. It's a polypore fungus. It's leathery and tough and really not good to eat. However, it's loaded with antioxidants, immune boosters, fatigue fighters, antibacterial qualities, and prebiotic qualities. This fungus has been used by ancient Chinese in their medicines. Maybe Hippocrates used it in Greece because ancient Greek medicine uses it too. This is probably the most researched fungus that, that I know of. Currently, it's being researched to determine if it has any effect against COVID-19 also against HIV, also against H1N1. Now bees, honeybees, have been known to self-medicate on mycelium. An extract derived from turkey tail has been used with honeybees and proven successful in the treatment of the fung of the um, excuse me of the viruses that plague honeybees, like the virus that varroa mites carry that will decimate a hive. One of the most researched fungi. I included this slide only because they're so beautiful. I was taken with the blue ones. Um, you, if you look really hard. Down in the center, the, the one on the lower right, it's obvious there's green on that one, but look closely um, at the center of these others, especially the, the ones that, that grow in a rosette shape. 
They can catch the rain. They can catch the dew, snow melt. That water sits there. I have always been um, frustrated that I could never get a super clear picture of a turkey tail. My pictures all turned out rather fuzzy. And I like to get really close up tight and, and take um, macro shots of, of mushrooms and small plants. It was small plants, by the way, here's, here's that ever popular moss growing on the fallen log that the turkey tail is growing in. Now that's a sandwich. Um, so when this turkey tail is retaining the, the water that it collects from various um, occurrences, it sits there. And soon as you know, there's an algae and it's anchored in, kept in place by those tiny little hairs that grow on a turkey tail. So my pictures were okay. They're fuzzy because the turkey tail is fuzzy. What roles do fungi take in their lifetime? They're recyclers, we know that. They break down structures in nature, reduce it to its major components and return it to the soil to rejuvenate the soil, to renew the soil. If you keep growing uh, on soil without renewing it, eventually the soil becomes depleted and it's really good for nothing. And our decomposers are the recyclers that renew our soil with the basic components of fallen organic matter. Mycorrhizae fungi, they're our good buddies. They do so many wonderful things for us. So many wonderful things. Just, in, just with the fact that 95% of plants utilize their services. Mushrooms give us food, they give us medicine. They're good at biocontrol. If you're a gardener and you understand what integrated pest management is, then you'll understand biocontrol. Integrated pest management lets nature take its course, whereas biocontrol, humans do the same thing, but they do it in the human way. And fungi also help us with plant and animal diseases. Who knew? Have you ever wondered what scientists do in their labs all day? Some of them bioprospect. They're trying to discover drugs. And it is said that when we get a prescription drug, part of the cost of that drug pays for bioprospecting. Bioprospecting led to an answer, anti cancer drug by the name of Texol. Maybe some of you know it. It comes from a fungus. We all know about penicillin that comes from a fungus. If you are familiar with or a fan of the book series or the TV series Outlander, you know that our heroine was able to produce her own penicillin in her very own kitchen with her very own moldy bread. Uh, uh, historical fiction, and I, I love this series, um, but we know that penicillin is uh, originating in a fungus. We have, from fungi, we have antifungals, antivirals, immunosuppressants, antimalarial drugs, drugs that help diabetes, psychotropic drugs, the ones that psychiatrists use in the practice of their craft, statins. I took lovastatin when it first came out. Maybe some of you did too. It was the first statin drug and it was made of fungus. Mushrooms can be divided into four main categories. The saprotrophic mus mushrooms are the ones that are the trash men, the decomposers that break down organic substances into their own components. We know what parasites are. They live off a host and eventually they may kill that host. Some mushrooms do that. And our buddies, the mycorrhizal mushrooms, and look at this list, isn't it funny that the, the tastiest ones come from mycorrhizae? And the last one is called the endophytes. 
the endophytic mushrooms, and some of these are on, on more than one list, you might notice. Endophytes partner up with a plant. Think lichen, kind of like that. But in that endophytic relationship, some very, very wonderful things can be accomplished. Bioremediation. There's a chemical spill and um, from a factory that makes pesticide, um, a bunch of that pesticide has leaked into a wetland. Very dangerous because we know that wetlands have access to groundwater and aquifers. Here come the endophytes. They can actually digest the pollutant in the water. That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. If you grow tall fescue as a lawn at your home, an endophytic fungi resides in that grass. And what does the endophytic fungi do for the grass? It renders it much more robust than bluegrass. It makes it healthier. It makes it resistant to disease. It makes it resistant to insect damage. That means we have to use less pesticide on that grass, which is good for all the pollinators, especially the bees. It does wonderful things for that fescue. The only drawback with fescue is it's a clumper. It, it doesn't stretch out and, and repair itself like rhizomatous grass, like bluegrass to fill in the bare spots. Um, tall fescue requires less fertilization and less water. All of that, all of those characteristics from endophytes within the grass. Um, if you were to give cattle a choice of two pastures, one that had grass, um, this tall fescue is used for grazing a whole lot. If you were to use fescue that does not contain an endophyte and put it in one pasture and the other pasture, you would grow tall fescue that has not the original endophyte, like the one that's in your lawn. This is a different harmless endophyte because the one in your lawn in the south of the United States, in the southern states, it's not so good for the grazing cattle or whatever animals are grazing there. So different strains of endophytes are used in pastures. So if you expose the cattle, cue the cows, the cows come in and they're allowed to choose. The cows, some of them will eat the grass without endophytes, but the one grass with harmless endophytes, with beneficial endophytes, the cattle will choose it every time. They like the flavor. It's not that they dislike the one without, they will eat that too. They will even eat the one that is harmful. It doesn't matter to them, but then they reap some bad rewards. So that's the story on endophytes. And we need to know more, more about these super important structures. In conclusion, as you read these words, fungi, fungi are changing the way life happens as they have done for more than a billion years. Listen for something familiar to you. Now, fungi are eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, nourishing and killing plants, surviving in space, inducing visions, the psych psychotropics, producing food, making medicine, manipulating animal behavior. There's a, a, a specific fungi that will invade an ant. 
and it will instruct the ant to find a, a particular plant. So the ant finds it. The ant is then instructed to climb to the tippy top of the plant and it does what the fungus tells it. And the fungus says, now wait there. So the ant stays there. And when it's time for that fungus to sporulate, it blows up the ant and disperses the spores far and wide because that ant is high up in the plant, covers a greater area, animal manipulation, and influencing, influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Our good buddies, the mycorrhizae, are major players in controlling how much CO2 is released into the atmosphere. Who knew? Another reason, yet another reason to love the mycorrhizae. And that is the end of our time with this presentation. The end for me, but not the end for you. You can do what I do is get online and research the things that aren't clear to you or that you want to learn more about. Here's a few odds and ends to pique your interest. Puffballs, you know, the little white brown fungi, puffballs release their spores through a hole in the top when they explode. I don't know if you can see it, but behind my photograph, um, there is an inset of a puffball blowing its top. If you want to dye your white t-shirt green, sage green, my favorite color, use oyster mushrooms. Some folks call mushrooms brain food. I think I do. It's fungi that makes blue cheese blue. And when you get your resource list from this presentation, it will have this link on it. You don't need to write it down here. It will be on the resource list. You might want to put it on your phone so that when you're out at the dunes looking for mushrooms and fungi to take pictures of, you can access this link and find the picture of the fungus you're looking at and get some information about it to help you to know what you're looking at. Your homework is actually going to be on that resource list too. Yes, you have homework. Who to Google or is it whom that's, that's grammatically correct? Suzanne Samard, the professor who is the mycorrhizal guru. Um, Peter Wallenben, the German um, mycologist who with Professor Samard has created a documentary called Intelligent Trees. It's on YouTube, find it. And I watched it three times so I could get all the information out of it that I was interested in. And then there is Paul Stamets, the actual know it all when it comes to fungi. And anybody with a name like Merlin Sheldrake, who is an author, has got to have some good things to say. So um, the very last thing I'm gonna point out to you, this photograph that is behind the slide happens to be Omphalotus eludens, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. I did it in, in black and white, so it wouldn't be so distracting. But the shape of this, please notice the shape of this. Um, Eludens refers to illumination. Umphalotus means it looks like a belly button. So um, if you have an innie, it might look like your belly button. Um, fini, my friends, we are done. Um, and if we have any questions, we can address those now. Okay, Mikey has a question. Well, first of all, he would like to say thank you very much. This has all been extremely insightful information. For the question, he says that you talked a lot about interconnectivity throughout the presentation, and he's wondering how we can facilitate beneficial fungal growth in our own micro environments or gardens. Well, we talked about not, not uh, heavily cultivating and disturbing what's already there um, because we said that 95% of plants use them. They find their way into areas and partner up with plants. I have seen them, I have seen mycorrhizae um, at Elsip Nursery. You can buy it and um, 
try to plant it uh, within your gardens. I'm not sure if it's going to take. Um, I, I attended a presentation at uh, Chicago Botanic um, and it was, it was a field trip um, given to our group of master gardeners. And we got to go into the back rooms, into the labs and talk with the researchers in there. And I did ask that question about mycorrhizae. Can we introduce mycorrhizae into our own gardens, into our own plants, into our own trees? Um, and I was told you have a chance of those um, mycorrhizal substances that you can buy, you have a chance of, of them taking, taking, uh, starting to grow in your garden. Um, I don't know anything that's foolproof to get mycorrhizae to grow. As a follow-up, Mikey asks, if we do have a fungal body growing in our garden already, how can we help maintain it? Um, by not using fungicides. <laughs> it is a fungus and um, yeah, you don't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to use fungicides. Another participant asks, how do you remove the cannonball fungus from cars or your home? This, this, was, this was really an accident on my part. Um, I found that it was time to wash the windows on my house. And I was getting lazy in my old age and didn't feel like getting up on the ladder because I have two that are very high up. And um, when I was a youngster, I would, I would take my power washer and go up a ladder and, and do it that way. But th that would be very foolish for me to do now. So I bought something called Windex Outdoors. It's pre-mixed. You attach it to your hose and you spray it on your windows. You do, it's got a, 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 a dial. First, you can wet it and then you turn the dial and then the soap comes through the hose and then you turn the dial again and you can rinse. Well, that worked like a champ on my windows. And as lazy as I was, and I was on that side of the house with the very tall windows, the rest of the house is uh, windowless and it's the side of the house that tends to get green algae on it. So I thought, what if? And I used it on the siding, on the vinyl siding on that side of the house. Um, I didn't. I only had to scrub a couple of the, the green um, areas and I used a very soft brush that I would normally use on my car and it took the algae off. What I didn't realize was gonna happen was that artillery shot fungus disappeared. I didn't have to, to scrub it. I didn't have to try to scrape it off with my fingernail. Um, I've used uh, remedies that I found online. One of them was uh, mouthwash and uh, a Mr. Clean scrubby sponge. Even that didn't do it. Um, but this stuff does a fine job. And that was two years ago. And that stuff, that, that Windex um, outdoors seems to have a residual effect. Um, like if you've ever used wet and forget, you spray it on and leave it there. And then the rains and snows in the winter wash off any dirt on your house and it will take off um, fungus and, and algae. And it has that residual effect. This, this um, Windex product seems to have that same residual effect. Last week, I went outside and took a hose and thought, you know, I don't feel like taking out <clears throat> the power washer. So I just took the hose and I rinsed off my back porch. It faces north and it really accumulates a lot of dirt. I rinsed off the dirt that was there. That was the residual effect of this product. So I can, I can recommend it highly, um, not just for windows, but to clean your, your vinyl siding. It did a, a, a little bit on my, my concrete porch. It did okay. That one, st the porch still needs the, the um, power washer because it's a rough texture, but the house looks wonderful. Just hosing it down this year. Victoria, could there be issues with spraying that product near plants? It did not bother my plants at all. Are there any other questions for Victoria? Okay, looks like we have one coming in. It says, 
does a bright color also always mean that a fungus is toxic or just red? Um, I've seen a lot of red mushrooms that are deadly poison. Um, I personally eat nothing from the wild. I don't know enough. Um, I don't know what I don't know. So I, I don't eat anything from, from the, the wild, whether it's ramps or wild onions or anything, no mushrooms ever, I don't. Um, I'm, I would be lying if I said, yes, I'm sure that red indicates a fungus, but often, uh, I mean, something that's toxic, but often in nature, red is, um, and shades of red are a warning sign. Yes, Victoria, we have a participant who has a question about compost. So they say they process some of the easier to break down garden waste, such as plant stalks and things like that, and are wondering if they could possibly expand from utilizing worms into utilizing fungal bodies to process some of the harder to break down waste, uh, such as wood waste and things like that. Um, a couple of years ago, I did an experiment on anaerobic decomposition of kitchen waste. And it's a process, um, well, Kashi, that's exactly what it is. Um, and it uses a couple of containers and it's an anaerobic process that actually ferments kitchen waste rather than decomposing it. And then it doesn't take long at all, just a few weeks and you bury it like in your garden, you can do pit composting. It's almost there. After a couple of weeks in the Bokashi bucket, you put it out in your garden and bury it. Um, in my garden, the raccoons would have a field day. But after a few more weeks of that being in the ground, you can dig down there and find nothing. It that quickly reverts to soil. And how this works is there is um, a granule that you put in that bucket um, in between the layers of, of kitchen waste that you put in there. And it's made of molasses. And I would think that if you got some of those Bokashi granules and tossed them into a compost pile, it might give it a jump start. You can make your own <laughs> your own Bokashi granules with uh, rice water and molasses, um, and it, it's a very complicated process, and you don't want to do it. So buy some Bokashi granules. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. Earlier, you had shown a, a slide or a picture of one fungal body growing on top of another, uh, the fruiting bodies of mushrooms, and so the question is: Does this mean that fungus are cannibalistic or do they just not care what they consume? I know what you're referring to. The mycelium growing on top of the other mushroom. Um, we know that fungi are decomposers. <laughs> um, they, they found the top of that mushroom favorable ground to germinate on. Um, and as far as being cannibalistic, um, some fungi, most fungi will decompose a dead thing, whether it's a dead tree limb, a dead tree that's fallen, a dead animal, um, they, they home in on dead things. If you remember the four categories that we divided mushrooms into, the second category was the parasites. There are those that are parasitic. Perhaps that particular mushroom, and I can't tell you what kind it was, I, it had a brown cap, that's all I remember. Um, maybe that particular mushroom, that particular fungus had some parasitic qualities as well. Because as we said, um, the, the fungi in those lists could appear on more than one list. So maybe that, that guy could appear on the parasitic list as well, because some mushrooms as we discussed are parasitic. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And thank you so much, Victoria, for sharing um, this presentation with us. It has been very educational and we appreciate your time. Thank you for coming everyone.